Professor Chomsky, perhaps we should start by trying to define what is not meant by anarchism. The word anarchy, after all, is derived from the Greek, literally meaning no government. Now, presumably, people who talk about anarchy or anarchism as a system of political philosophy don't just mean that, as it were, as of January the 1st next year, government, as we now understand it, would suddenly cease. There would be no policemen, no rule of the road, no laws, no tax collectors, no, uh, no post office, and so forth. They presumably mean something more complicated than that. Well, yes to some of those questions, no to others. They may very well mean no policemen, uh, but I don't think they would mean no rules of the road. In fact, uh, I should say to begin with that it, the term anarchism is used to cover quite a range of uh, political ideas, but I'm going to follow your lead and think of it as the libertarian left. And from that point of view, anarchism can be conceived as a kind of voluntary socialism that is uh, uh, a, a, a libertarian socialist or an anarcho-syndicalist or a communist anarchist uh, in the tradition of, say, Bakunin and Kropotkin and others, uh, had in mind a highly organ organized form of society, but uh, a society that was organized on the basis of uh, organic units, organic communities, and generally they meant by that uh, the workplace or the neighborhood or both. And from those two basic units uh, involving the place where a person works and spends his creative energies and the place where he lives uh, in relation to his neighbors and others around him, from those two basic units there could derive through federal arrangements uh, a highly integrated kind of uh, social organization uh, which might be national or even international in scope where decisions could be made over uh, a substantial range but by delegates who are always part of the organic community from which they come and are returned to it and are revocable and in general would live there in fact. So it doesn't mean a society in which there is, literally speaking, no government so much as a society in which the primary authority and source of authority comes, as it were, from the bottom up and not exactly. from the top down, uh, where representative democracy, as we have it in the United States and in Britain, would be regarded as a form of from the top down authority, even though ultimately the voters decide. Well, representative democracy, uh, as in, say, the United States of Great Britain, would be, would be criticized by an anarchist of this school on, on really two grounds. Uh, first of all, because there is a monopoly of power centralized in the state. And secondly, uh, and critically, because uh, uh, representative democracy is limited to the political sphere and in no way, in no serious way, encroaches on the economic sphere. And anarchists of this tradition have always held that, uh, that democratic control of uh, one's productive life is at the core of any... Uh, serious uh, human liberation or for that matter any significant uh, democratic practice that is as long as they're as long as individuals are compelled to rent themselves uh, on the market uh, to those who are willing to to hire them uh, and as long as their role in production is simply that of, of uh, ancillary tools then uh, there are striking elements of coercion and oppression that make talk of democracy very limited, if even meaningful. Historically, have there been any uh, sustained examples on any substantial scale of uh, societies which approximated to the anarchist ideal? There are small societies, uh, small in number, that have, I think, done so quite well, and there are a few examples of large-scale uh, libertarian revolutions which were largely anarchist in their structure uh, as to the first small societies ex extending over a long period I myself think the most dramatic example is uh, perhaps the Israeli kibbutzim uh, which for a long period uh, may or may not be true today but for a long period were uh, really were constructed on, on anarchist principles that is of uh, self-management uh, di direct worker control uh, integration of agriculture, industry, service, personal life uh, in, on an egalitarian basis with direct and in fact quite active participation in, in self-management and were, I should think, extraordinarily successful by, well, almost any measure that one can, can impose. But they were presumably, uh, and indeed still are, in the framework of a conventional state which guarantees certain uh, well, they basic always. stabilities. Well, actually the history is rather interesting. Up until 
since, since 1948, they've been in the framework of a conventional state. Prior to that, they were uh, within the framework of a, uh, a colonial enclave. And in fact, there was a subterranean society, a largely cooperative society, which was not really part of the, uh, the system of the British mandate, but was functioning outside of it. And to some extent, that survived the establishment of, of the state, though, of course, it became integrated into the state and, in my view, uh, lost some of the, a fair amount of its uh, libertarian socialist character through this process and through other processes which are unique to the history of that region, which we need not go into. Uh, however, as functioning libertarian socialist institutions, I think they are of an interesting model that... Uh, I think it's highly relevant to uh, advanced industrial societies in a way in which some of the other examples that have existed in the past are not. Uh, a, a, a good example of a really large-scale anarchist revolution, or largely anarchist revolution, in fact, the best example, to my knowledge, is the Spanish Revolution in 1936, in which uh, over, well, most of Republican Spain, there was a... Uh, 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 quite inspiring, in my view, uh, uh, anarchist revolution that involved both industry and agriculture over substantial areas uh, uh, developed in a way which, to the outside, looks spontaneous, though, in fact, if you look at the roots of it, one discovers that it was based on, oh, three generations of, uh, of uh, experiment and thought and work which had extended anarchist ideas to very large parts of the of the population in this largely pre-industrial, though not totally pre-industrial society. And that again was, well, by, by both human measures and uh, even anyone's economic measures, uh, quite successful. That is, production uh, continued effectively. Uh, workers in farms and factories proved quite capable of managing their affairs without coercion from above, uh, contrary to what lots of socialists, uh, communists, liberals, and others wanted to believe. And in fact, uh, you can't tell what would have happened. That, that anarchist revolution was destroyed, was simply destroyed by force. But during the period of its, uh, uh, in which it was alive, I think it was uh, a highly successful and, and, as I say, in many ways, really inspiring testimony to the ability of, uh, of poor working people to uh, organize, manage uh, their affairs extremely successfully without coercion and control. How relevant the Spanish experience is to an advanced industrial society, one might one might question in detail. It's clear that the fundamental idea of anarchism is the the primacy of uh, the individual, not necessarily in isolation, but with other individuals, and uh, and the fulfilment of his freedom. This, in a sense, looks awfully like the founding ideas of the the United States of America. Now, what is it about the American experience which has made freedom as used in that tradition become a suspect and indeed a tainted phrase mm -hmm. in the minds of um, anarchist and libertarian socialist thinkers like yourself? Well, uh, many anarchists, uh, let me just say I don't really regard myself as an anarchist thinker. I'm a derivative uh, fellow traveler, let's say. <laughs> uh, anarchist thinkers have constantly referred to, uh, to the American experience and to the ideal of Jeffersonian democracy very, very favorably. Uh, uh, however, what they've, and so, you know, Jefferson's concept that the best government is the government which governs least, or, or Thoreau's addition to that, that the best government is the one that doesn't govern at all, is one that's often repeated by anarchist thinkers to, to modern times. However, the uh, ideal, the, uh, the concept of Jeffersonian democracy, uh, putting aside the fact that it was a slave society, uh, developed in an essentially pre capitalist uh, system. That is, in a, in a society in which there were no, there was no uh, uh, a monopolistic uh, control of, uh, uh, there, there were no centers of private power, let's say, no, no significant centers of private power. In fact, it's striking to read today, to go back and to read some of the classic libertarian texts. If, if one reads, say, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt's uh, Critique of the State in 1792, a work that certainly inspired Mill, uh, and a, and a significant classic uh, impure, uh, libertarian text. He doesn't speak at all of the need to uh, resist private concentration of power. Rather, he, s he speaks of the need to resist the encroachment and of coercive state power. And uh, that is 
what one finds also in the early American tradition. But the well, reason that was the only kind of power there the was. The only kind of power there was. I mean, Humboldt takes for granted that individuals are roughly equivalent in their private power, and that the only real imbalance of power that one sees is the centralized authoritarian state, and individual freedom must be uh, sustained against its intrusion. The state of the church. I mean, that's what he feels one must resist. Now, uh, when he speaks, uh, Humboldt, for example, of the need for control of one's creative life for the when he when he uh, decries the alienation of labor and, uh, that arises from uh, coercion or even instruction or guidance in one's work rather than self-management in one's work he's giving an anti, a, a uh, an anti-statist he's developing an anti-statist or, or anti-theocratic ideology but the same principles apply very well to the uh, capitalist industrial society that emerged later And I would think that a Humboldt, had he been consistent, uh, would have ended up being a, uh, a libertarian socialist rather than the... Uh, Don't these precedents suggest that the, um, there is something inherently <coughs> pre-industrial about the uh, ac applicability of uh, libertarian ideas in this way, that it necessarily presupposes a rather rural, simple society in which the technologies of production are fairly simple, in which the economic organization tends to be small-scale and mm. uh, localized, and in which all the problems which we associate with modern industrial society just aren't there. Well, let me separate that into two questions. Mm. One, how anarchists have felt about that, and, and two, what I think is the case. Mm. Uh, as far as anarchist reactions to that, there, there are two. There, mm. there, there has been an anarchist tradition, which was, uh, and one might think, say, of Kropotkin as a representative, which was... Uh, which, which had much of the character that you described. On the other hand, there's another anarchist tradition that develops into anarcho-syndicalism, which simply regarded uh, anarchist ideas as the proper mode of organization for a highly complex uh, advanced industrial society. And that tendency in anarchism merges, or at least interrelates very, very closely with uh, uh, a variety of left-wing Marxism, the kind that one finds in, say, the Council of Communists, that grew up in the Luxembourgian tradition and that is later represented by, by Marxist theorists like, say, Anton Panikuk and, uh, well, uh, who developed a, a whole theory of workers' councils in, in industry as the, and who was himself a scientist and astronomer, very much part of the uh, industrial world, of Dutch, Dutch Marxist. Now, it's the latter. Now, so which of these two views is correct? I mean, is it necessary that anarchist concepts belong to the pre-industrial phase of human society, or is it the rational mode of organization for a highly advanced industrial society? Well, I, I myself believe the latter. That is, I think that industrialization uh, and the advance of technology uh, raises possibilities for uh, self-management over a broad scale that simply didn't exist in an earlier period, and that, in fact, this is precisely the rational mode for a... Uh, an advanced and complex industrial society, one in which workers can very well become uh, masters of their own immediate affairs, that is, direction of and control of the shop, but also can be in a position to make, uh, to make the major substantive decisions uh, concerning the structure of the economy, concerning social institutions, concerning planning regionally and beyond, uh, because they can have, in fact, objectively now, uh, that is, technology permits and industrialization permits, institutions do not permit uh, them to have uh, control over the requisite information, the, uh, relevant, inf uh, the uh, uh, relevant training to understand these matters. A good deal can be automated. Uh, much of the necessary work that is required to keep a decent level of social life going can be really consigned to machines, at least in principle, which means humans can be free to, uh, uh, to undertake uh, the kind of creative work which may not have been possible objectively in early stages of the Industrial Revolution. I'd like to pursue in a moment the question of the, the economics of no. uh, an anarchist society, but could you sketch in a little more broadly the kind of political constitution of an anarchist society as you would see it in modern conditions? Would there be political parties, for example? Mm. What forms of government, residual forms of government, would in fact remain? Well, as let me sketch what a, a kind of a, what I think would be perhaps a rough consensus uh, and one that I think is essentially correct. Uh, beginning with these two modes of immediate organization and control, namely organization and control in the workplace and in the community, uh, one can imagine a 
network of uh, workers' councils uh, at a higher level uh, uh, representation across a factory or across branches of industry mm -hmm. or across crafts and on to general assemblies of workers' councils that can be regional and national and international in character. And from another point of view, one can project a system of governance that involves uh, local assemblies, uh, again, federated regionally, dealing with regional issues, uh, crossing crafts, industries, trades, and so on, and uh, again, uh, general at the level of the nation or beyond uh, through federation and so on. Now, they, each of these, and, and exactly, exactly how these would develop and how they would inter, inter, interrelate and whether you need both of them or only one, well, these are matters over which anarchist theoreticians have debated and, uh, and many detailed proposals exist, uh, and I don't, I don't feel confident to take a stand. In fact, I think these are questions that pretty much would have to be worked out. But there would not, yeah. for example, be direct national elections and uh, political parties organized well, from coast mm -hmm. to coast, as it were, or from north to south in Britain to um, mm -hmm. win those kind of elections. Would that? Because if, if there were, that right. would presumably create a kind yeah. of a, a central authority Anarchism. which would be well, integral to the idea of anarchism. Right. No, the, the idea of anarchism is that uh, delegation of authority is rather minimal. That is, participants at any one of these levels of government, representatives at any one of these levels of government, should be directly responsive to the organic community in which they live. And in fact, the optimal situation would be that uh, participation in one of these mm -hmm. levels of government should on the one hand be temporary and even during the period when it's taking place should be only partial. That is, the members of a workers' council who are for some period actually functioning to make short-run decisions that other people don't, wanna, don't have the time to make should nevertheless be in part also uh, continuing to do their work as part of the uh, workplace or neighborhood community in which they belong. Now, as for political parties, uh, my feeling is that an anarchist society would not forcefully present, prevent uh, physical uh, political parties from, from arising. In fact, uh, anarchism has always been based on the idea that any sort of Procrustean bed, any, any sort of system of norms that's imposed on social life will, will constrain and very much underestimate its, its energy and vitality and that all sorts of new possibilities of voluntary organization may develop that we may not even think of today at that higher level of uh, material and intellectual culture. But I think it is fair to say that insofar as political parties are felt to be necessary, uh, anarchist organization of society will, will have failed. That is, it should be the case, I would think, that uh, where there is direct participation in self-management, uh, in economic and social affairs, then factions, conflicts, uh, differences of interest and, and idea and opinion, which should be uh, welcomed and uh, uh, cultivated, will be expressed at every one of these levels. Why they should fall into two or three or n political parties, I don't quite see. I think that the complexity of human interest and, and life is uh, that does not fall in that fashion. Parties represent basically class interests. Uh, or largely and classes so. would not exist in and classes country. would have been eliminated or transcended in, in such a society one last question on the political organization is there not a danger that with this sort of hierarchical tier of uh, uh, assemblies and quasi governmental structure without direct elections that the uh, the central body or the body that is in some sense at the top of this uh, pyramid gets very remote from the people uh, on the ground, and since it will have to have some powers, if it's going to deal with international affairs, for example, deal with other countries, and may even have to mm. have control over armed forces and things like that, that it would be less democratically responsive than the existing regime. Well, first of all, there would be direct uh, elections under any, except the direct elections would be at every one of these levels. That is, uh, as far as the lowest level is concerned, say the, the next level, the next level would then elect oh, okay. the level above that. Now, the question is, I, I think it's a, it's a very important uh, property of any uh, libertarian society will be to prevent an evolution in the direction that you've mm. described, which is a possible evolution, and one that institutions should be designed to abort, to prevent. And I think that that's entirely possible. I mean, I'm myself, I'm totally unpersuaded that uh, participation in governance is a full-time job. I don't think it is. 
Uh, it may be in, in an irrational society where there are uh, uh, all sorts of problems that arise because of the uh, irrational nature of institutions. But in, in a properly functioning uh, advanced industrial society organized along libertarian lines, I would think that executing decisions taken by representative bodies uh, is a part-time job which should be rotated throughout the community and furthermore should be undertaken by people who are at all times uh, continue to be participants in their own direct uh, activity. Now, it may be, it's possible that uh, it is necessary to have uh, it, it, that, that governance is itself uh, a function on a par with, say, steel production. If that turns out to be true, and I think that's a question of empirical fact that has to be determined, can't be projected out of the mind. But if it turns out to be true, then it seems to me the natural suggestion is that governance should be organized industrially as simply another branch of industry. That is, the uh, civil servants or others who are involved in this form of activity, taking it to be, a, by hypothesis now, uh, a meaningful and useful form of activity, mm. uh, that they themselves should be organized as simply one of the branches of industry with their own w workers' councils and their own self-governance and their own participation in broader assemblies. Uh, now, that's, and I might say that in the spontaneous development of workers' councils that has occasionally appeared here and there in the world, well, for example, in the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, that's pretty much what happened. There was, as I recall, a workers' council of state employees, of, uh, I forget what they called themselves, civil servants or something like that, who were simply organized along industrial lines as another branch of industry. That's perfectly possible. And it should be or could be an, a barrier against the creation of a, the kind of yeah. remote coercive bureaucracy that anarchists, of course, fear. Professor Chomsky, I'd like to press you a little bit further about the way in which uh, effective democratic control would be achieved consistently with uh, discharging the necessary functions of such a society. If you suppose that uh, there would continue to be a need for self-defense um, on quite a sophisticated level, mm. um, I don't quite see from your description how you would achieve effective control by the system of part-time uh, representative uh, councils at various levels from the bottom up over an organization as, as powerful and uh, as necessarily technically sophisticated as, for example, the Pentagon, which is a body with which you've had a, quite a long record of mm -hmm. conflict over the Vietnam War and other matters in uh, recent years. Can you describe how uh, the uh, Pentagon Absolutely. could, at one at the same time, be efficient as a defense organization and nonetheless properly responsive to democratic control within the United States if it wasn't an anarchist society? Well, first, we should be a little clear, clear about terminology. You refer to the Pentagon, as is usually done, as a defense organization. And, in fact, uh, I remember very well in 1947 when the uh, National Defense Act was passed that established the uh, current system of war-making, uh, the former War Department, the, the American Department uh, concerned with war at that period, up to that time, was the Army Department, honestly yeah. the War Department, yeah. and it had branches. And its name was changed in that act to the Defense Department. And any sophisticated uh, person, and I don't, I was a student then and didn't think I was very sophisticated, but I knew and everyone knew that this meant that to whatever extent that the American military had been involved in defense in the past, and partially it had been, so this was now over. Since it was being called the Defense Department, that meant it was going to be a Department of Aggression, nothing well, else. The principle of never and believe anything till it's officially denied. Right, sort of uh, on the assumption that Orwell essentially had captured the nature of the modern state. Uh, and that's exactly the case. I mean, the Pentagon is in no sense a Defense Department. It's not, it has never defended the United States from anyone. It has only served to uh, conduct aggression. Uh, and uh, I think that the American people would be much better off without a Pentagon. I don't, they certainly don't need it for defense. I think its intervention in, in international affairs has never been, well, you know, never is a strong word, but I think you, can, you would be hard put to find a case. Certainly it has not been its characteristic uh, pose to support uh, freedom or liberty or uh, to defend people uh, uh, and so on. That's not the role of the, of the massive uh, military organization that is controlled by the Defense Department. Rather, its, its tasks are, are two, both quite antisocial, uh, the first is to uh, preserve an international system 
in which what are called American interests, which primarily means business interests, can flourish. And secondly, uh, it has an internal economic task. I mean, the Pentagon has been the primary Keynesian mechanism whereby uh, the government intervenes to uh, maintain what is ludicrously called the health of the economy by uh, by its uh, by uh, inducing production. That means production of waste. Now, both of those uh, both of those functions serve certain interests. In fact, dominant interests, class inter dominant class interests in American society. But I uh, don't think that they, in any sense, serve the the public interest. And I would think that uh, that this system of uh, production of waste and of destruction would essentially be dismantled in a libertarian society. Now, one shouldn't be too glib about this. If, let's say, a uh, well, if, if one can imagine, let's say, a social revolution in the United States, that's rather distant, I would assume. But if that took place, it's hard to imagine that there would be any. A uh, credible enemy from the outside that could threaten that social revolution. Uh, we wouldn't be attacked by Mexico or uh, you know, uh, Hawaii or something like that. Uh, well, it's part of the United States, Cuba, let's say. Uh, the the uh, an American revolution would be uh, would would not require, I think, defense against aggression. On the other hand, if a libertarian social revolution were to take place, say, in Western Europe. Then I think the problem of defense would be very critical. I was going to say, I mean, it, it cannot surely be inherent in the anarchist idea that there should be no self-defense, because such anarchist experiments as there have been have, on the record, Required. actually been destroyed from oh, it's without. It's not. Yeah. Uh, but let, I think that these questions have to be cannot be given a general answer. They have to be answered specifically relative to specific specific uh, history historical and objective conditions. Yeah, it's just that I found a little difficulty in following before the break your description of uh, the proper democratic control right. of this kind of an organization on the basis that the defense organization itself would become some kind of uh, workers cooperative. And I wouldn't because say that. I find it a little hard to see no, the generals no. controlling themselves in right. a manner which you would approve of. Well, that's why I, 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 I do want to point out the complexity of the issue. Mm. It depends on the country and the society and, uh, that we're talking about. In the United States, one kind of problem arises. If there were a libertarian social revolution in Europe, then I think the problems you raise would be very serious because there would be a, a serious problem of defense. That is, I would assume that if libertarian socialism were achieved at some level in Western Europe, there would be a direct military threat both from the Soviet Union and from the United States. And the problem would be how that should be countered. Uh, that's the problem that was faced by the Spanish Revolution. There, there was a direct military intervention by, uh, well, really three-pronged, by fascists, by communists, and by the liberal democracies uh, in the background. And the question how one can defend oneself against attack at this level is a very serious one. Uh, however, I think uh, we have to raise the question whether centralized standing armies uh, with uh, uh, high technology deterrence are the most effective way to do that. And that's by no means obvious. Uh, for example, I don't think that a Western European centralized army would itself deter, say, a Russian-American attack to prevent libertarian socialism, the kind of attack that I would quite frankly expect at some level, maybe not military, at least economic. But nor, on the other hand, would a lot of peasants with uh, pitchforks and spades. And we're not talking about peasants. We're talking about uh, a highly sophisticated, highly urban industrial society. And it seems to me its best method of, method of defense would be its political appeal to the uh, working class in the, uh, uh, in the countries that were part of the attack. That's part. But again, I don't want to be glib. It might need tanks. It might need armies. And if it does, I think we can be fairly sure that that would contribute to the possible failure or at least decline of the uh, revolutionary force for exactly the reasons you mentioned. That is, I think it's extremely hard to imagine how, a, uh, uh, how a, an effective centralized army deploying tanks, planes, strategic weapons, and so on could function. If that's what's required to preserve the revolutionary structures, well, then I think they may well not be if preserved. The, if the basic defense is the political appeal, or the appeal of the political and economic organization, perhaps we could look in a little more detail at that. You wrote uh, in one of your essays that in a decent society, everyone would have the opportunity to find interesting work, and each person would be permitted the fullest possible scope for his talents. And then you went on to ask, what more would be required, in particular, extrinsic reward in the form of wealth and power, only if we assume that applying one's talents in interesting and socially useful work is not rewarding in itself. And I 
think that that line of reasoning is certainly one of the things that uh, appeals to a lot of people, but it still needs to be explained, I think, why the kind of work which people would find interesting and appealing and fulfilling to do would coincide at all closely with the kind of work which, as it were, needs to be done if we're to sustain anything like the standard of living which people mm. demand and are used to. Well, there's a certain amount of work that just has to be done if we're to maintain that standard of living. Right. Uh, it's an open question how onerous that work has to be. Let's recall that uh, science and technology and intellect have not been devoted to examining that question or to overcoming the onerous and self-destructive character of the necessary work of society. The reason is that it has always been assumed that there is a substantial body of wage slaves who will do it simply because otherwise they'll starve. However, if human intelligence is uh, turned to the question of how to make the necessary work of society itself meaningful, we don't know what the answer will be. My, my guess is that a fair amount of it can be made uh, entirely tolerable. Uh, it's a mistake to think that uh, uh, even backbreaking physical labor is necessarily onerous. Many people, I included, do it for relaxation. Uh, if it's under our own control, uh, part-time and so on. Well, this weekend, for example, I got it into my head to plant 34 trees in a meadow out behind the house, for example, from the State Conservation Commission, which meant I had to dig 34 holes in the sand. Well, that's you know, for me and uh, what I do with my time, mostly pretty hard work, but I have to admit I enjoyed it. Uh, I wouldn't have enjoyed it if I'd had work norms, if I'd had an overseer, if I'd been ordered to do it at a certain moment, uh, and so on. On the other hand, if it's a, a task taken out of just interest, fine, that can be done. And I think that a good, and that's without any technology, without any, you know, without any... Uh, uh, thought given to how to design the work and so on. I, I put it to you that there may be a danger that this view of things is a rather romantic uh, mm. delusion entertained only by a small elite of people who happen, like professors, perhaps journalists mm. and so on, to be in the very privileged situation of having jobs in the sense that they are paid yeah. to do what any way okay. they like to do. That's why I began with a big if. I said we first have to ask to what extent would the, let's call it the necessary work of society, namely that work which is required to maintain the standard of living that we want, question, first question is, to what extent need this be onerous and undesirable? That's an unknown question, I think, much less than it is today. But let's assume there is some extent to which it remains onerous. Well, in that case, the answer is quite simple. That work simply has to be shared, it has to be equally shared among people capable of doing it. Uh, and Everyone beyond spends that, a certain number of months a year working on an automobile production line and a certain number that, of years if, collecting the garbage. And If it turns out that these are really tasks which people will find no self-fulfillment in. Incidentally, I don't quite believe that. Say, as I watch people work, craftsmen, let's say, yeah. automobile mechanics, for example, mm. I think one often finds a good deal of pride in work. Uh, I think, and in fact, I think that that kind of pride in work well done uh, and in complicated work well done, because... It takes thought and intelligence uh, to do it, especially when one is also involved in management of the enterprise, uh, determination of how the work will be organized, uh, what it's for, uh, what, it's, what the purposes of the work are, what will happen to it, and so on. And it seems to me all of this can be satisfying and rewarding activity, which, in fact, requires skills and which the kinds of skills that people will enjoy exercising. However, I, I, I am thinking hypothetically now. Suppose it turns out that there is some residue of work which really no one wants to do, whatever that may be. Okay, then I say that that residue of work must be equally shared. And yeah. beyond that, people will be free to exercise their talents as they see fit. But I put it to you, Professor, that if that residue were very large, as some people would say it was, like it accounted for about the work involved in producing 90% of what we all want mm -hmm. to consume, um, then the organization of sharing it on the basis that everybody little, did a little bit of all the nasty jobs would uh, become wildly inefficient, uh, because after all, even the nasty jobs you have to be trained to do and equipped to do, and well, that the um, efficiency of the whole mm. economy would suffer, and therefore the standard of living which it sustained would be reduced. Mm. Well, for one thing, not uh, let's, I, mean, I, I think this is really quite hypothetical, because I don't believe that the figures are anything like that. Mm. As I say, it seems to me that if human intelligence were devoted to uh, asking how technology can design to fit, be designed to fit the needs of the human producer, instead of conversely. That is, now we ask how the human being with his
special properties can be fitted into a technological system designed for other ends, namely production for profit. My feeling is that if that were done, we would find that the really unwanted work is far smaller than you suggest. But whatever it is, let's say, whatever amount it is, uh, notice that we have two alternatives. One alternative is to have it equally shared. The other is to design social institutions so that some group of people will be simply compelled to do that work on pain of starvation. Those are the two alternatives. Well, now, well, given I'd those two... Compelled to, not compelled to do it, but they might agree to do it voluntarily because they were paid to do it an amount which they felt made it worthwhile. Well, but you see, I'm assuming that everyone essentially gets the essentially equal re remuneration. Don't forget that we're not talking about a society now where the, or perhaps you are, but where the people who are do the onerous work are paid substantially more than the people who do the work that they do on choice. It's quite the opposite. Uh, the way our society works, the way any class society works, the people who do the unwanted work are the ones who are paid least. That is, that work is done and we sort of put it out of our minds because it's assumed that there will be a massive class of people who uh, can, who's own, who control only one factor of production, namely their labor, and have to sell it. And they'll have to do that work because they have nothing else to do, and they'll be paid very little for it. Now, one can imagine, so let's I accept a correction, let's imagine three kinds of society. One, the current one, in which the undesired work is given to wage slaves. That's the current system. Let's imagine a second system in which the undesired work, after the best efforts to make it meaningful, the undesired work is shared. And let's imagine a third system where the undesired work uh, receives high extra pay so that individuals voluntarily choose to do it. Well, it seems to me that either of the two latter systems are consistent with, vaguely speaking, anarchist principles. I myself would argue for the second rather than the third. But either of the two is quite remote from any present uh, social organization or any tendency in contemporary social organization. Let me put the dilemma to you in <coughs> another way. It seems to me that there is a fundamental choice, however one disguises it, as to whether you organize work for the satisfaction that it gives to the people who do it or whether you give, organize it on the basis of the value of what is produced to the people who are going to use or consume uh, what is produced. And that a society which, as it were, was organized on the basis of giving everybody the maximum opportunity to fulfill their hobbies, which is essentially the work for work's sake, uh, view, finds its logical culmination uh, in the monastery, whereas mm. it were the kind of work which is done is, namely prayer, mm. is, is work for the self-enrichment of the work, and where nothing is produced which is of any use to anybody, and you live either at a low standard of living or you actually starve. Well, there are, there are some factual assumptions here, and I disagree with you about the factual assumptions. Uh, my feeling is that part of what makes work meaningful is that it, it, it does have use, that its products do have use. Uh, work, the work of a craftsman uh, is in part meaningful to that craftsman because of the intelligence and skill that he puts into it, but also in part because the work is useful. And I might say the same is true of a scientist. I mean, uh, the fact that the kind of work you do may lead to something else, that's what it means in science, you know, may contribute to something else. That's very important, quite apart from the elegance and beauty of what you may achieve. Uh, and I think that that covers every field of human endeavor. Uh, furthermore, I think that if we look at the, a good part of human history, we'll find that people, to a substantial extent, did get some degree of satisfaction, often a lot of satisfaction, from the productive and creative work that they were doing. And I think that the chances for that are enormously enhanced by industrialization. Why? Precisely because much of the most meaningless drudgery can be uh, taken over by machines, which means that the scope for really creative human work is substantially enlarged. Now, you speak of work freely undertaken as hobby, but I don't believe that. I think work freely undertaken can be useful, meaningful work done well. Also, you pose a dilemma, which many people pose, between the desire for satisfaction in work and the desire uh, to create things of value to the community. But it's not so obvious that that's a, a dilemma, that that's a contradiction. So it's by no means clear, in fact, I think it's false, that contributing to the enhancement of pleasure and satisfaction in work is inversely proportional to contributing to the value of that work. It might be inversely proportional, but it might be unrelated. I mean, take some very simple thing, like selling ice creams on the beach on a mm. public holiday. Um, it's, a, it's a service to society. Undoubtedly, people want the ice creams. They feel hot. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to see in what sense there is a, either a craftsman's joy or a great sense of social... Uh, 
uh, virtue or nobility in performing that task. Why would well, anyone say, perform seen, that task if they were not rewarded for it? I've seen some very cheery-looking ice cream vendors who sure, haven't liked the idea. A lot of money. That, and they haven't liked the idea that they're giving children ice cream, which seems to me a perfectly reasonable way to spend one's time as compared with uh, thousands of other occupations that I can imagine. Recall that a person has an occupation, and uh, it seems to me that most of the occupations that exist, especially the ones that involve what are called service, that is, relations to human beings, have an intrinsic satisfaction and reward associated with them, namely in the dealings with the human beings that are involved. That's true of teaching, and it's true of ice cream vending. I agree that ice cream vending doesn't require the uh, commitment of intelligence that teaching does, and maybe for that reason it will be a less desired occupation. But if so, it will have to be shared. However, what I'm saying is that we, our characteristic assumption that pleasure in work, pride in work, is either unrelated to or negatively related to the value of the output, that's an assumption which is related to, to a particular s stage of social history, namely capitalism, in which human beings are tools of production. It is by no means necessarily true. For example, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at interviews with workers on assembly lines, for example, that have been done over and over again by people who do industrial psychology, you find that one of the things they complain about over and over again is the fact that their work simply can't be well done the fact that the assembly line goes through so fast that they cannot do their work properly. Their pride in craftsmanship is itself to be... Let, let me just mention another... Well, I, I just happened to look recently at a uh, study of uh, longevity in some journal of gerontology. Don't ask me why I was reading that. And uh, it uh, tried to trace the factors that you could use to predict longevity, length of life. And, uh, you know, cigarette smoking, drinking, uh, genetic factors, everything was looked at. It turned out that the factor that was the highest predictor, the most successful predictor, was job satisfaction. Now, people who have nice jobs live long. People who are satisfied with their jobs. Now, what leads to job satisfaction? See, and I think that makes a good deal of sense, you know, because that's where you spend your life and that's where your creative activities are. Now, what leads to job satisfaction? Well, I think many things lead to it. And the knowledge that you're doing something useful to the community is an important part of that, which many people feel. I mean, many people feel and uh, uh, many people who are satisfied with their work are people who feel that what they're doing is important to do. They can be teachers, they can be doctors, they can be scientists, they can be craftsmen, they can be farmers. I mean, I think the feeling that what you're doing is important, is worth doing, you know, contributes to those with whom you have social bonds. That's a very significant factor in in one's personal satisfaction. And over and above that, there's the pride in, uh, and the, and the self-fulfillment that comes from a job well done, from simply taking your skills and putting them to use. And I don't see any reason why that should be, uh, why that should in any way harm. In fact, I should think that that would enhance the value of what's produced. But let's imagine still that at some level it does harm it. Well, okay, at that point, the society, the community, has to decide how to make compromises. Each individual is both a producer and a consumer, after all. And that means that each individual has to join in those socially determined compromises, if in fact there are compromises. And again, I feel that the nature of the compromise is much exaggerated because of the distorting prism of uh, a really coercive uh, and self and personally destructive system right. in which. You say the community has to make decisions about compromises. And, um, of course, communist theory provides for this in its whole thinking about national planning, decisions about uh, investment, directions of investment, and uh, so forth. In an anarchist society, uh, it would seem that, that you, you're not willing to provide for that amount of uh, governmental superstructure that would be necessary to uh, make the plans, make the investment decisions, to decide these kind of uh, compromises into, between... Uh, whether you give priority to what people want to consume or whether you give priority to the work people want to do. I don't agree with that. I mean, it seems to me that anarchist or, for that matter, left Marxist mm -hmm. structures mm -hmm. based on systems of workers' councils and federation provide exactly the set of levels of decision-making at which decisions can be made about a national plan. Similarly, state socialist societies also provide a level of decision-making, let's say, the nation, at which national plans can be produced. There's no difference in that respect. The difference has to do with the, uh, with the participation in those decisions and control over those decisions. The anarchist and left Marxist views, views like the workers' councils theory of 
say, the Council Communists, who were Marxists, left Marxists. In their views, those decisions are made by the informed working class through uh, their assemblies and their direct representatives who live among them and work among them. In the state socialist systems, the national plan is made by a, by a, federal, by a national bureaucracy, uh, which accumulates to itself all relevant information, uh, makes decisions, offers them to the public, and occasionally, every few years, puts itself, uh, uh, comes before the public and says, you can pick me or you can pick him, but we're all part of this uh, remote bureaucracy. These are the, ext these are the uh, poles, these are the polar opposites within the, so within the socialist tradition. But in fact, there's a very considerable role for the state and possibly even for Not civil for servants for a bureaucracy, but it's the control over it that's different. Well, see, I don't, as I say, I don't really believe that we need a separate bureaucracy to carry out... Uh, governmental decisions. You need various forms of expertise. Ah, yeah, but expert, see, expertise is very much... Let's take expertise with regard to economic planning. Okay, this, certainly in any complex industrial society, there should be a group of technicians whose task is to produce plans uh, and to uh, lay out the consequences of decisions to show and explain uh, to people who have to make the decisions that if you decide this, you're going to likely get this consequence because that's what our linear programming model shows and so on. But the point is that those planning systems are themselves, well, they're industries, and they are simply part of the, they will have their workers' councils, and they will be part of the whole council system. And, one, and, and the distinction is that these planning systems do not make decisions. They produce plans in exactly the same way as automakers produce autos. The plans are then available for the, for the workers' councils and uh, council assemblies the same way that autos are available to ride in. Now, of course, what this does require is an informed and educated working class, but that's precisely what we are capable of achieving in advanced industrial societies. And this is really basically the last question, which is how far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication. I think it not only depends on it, but in fact the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation. Precisely that kind of great transformation in, uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire, precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation in the nature of work, the nature of creative activity, simply in social bonds among people. And through this interaction of creating institutions which permit new aspects of human nature to flourish and then uh, the building of still further libertarian institutions to which these liberated human beings can contribute. This is the evolution of socialism as, as I understand it. And very finally, Professor Jomsky, what do you think of the chances of uh, societies along these lines coming into being in the major industrial countries of the West as we refer to them in the next quarter of a century or so? I don't think I'm wise enough uh, or informed enough to make predictions, and I think that predictions probably reflect personality more than judgment generally about such poorly understood matters. But I think this much at least we can say. Uh, there are obvious tendencies in industrial capitalism towards concentration of power uh, in narrow economic empires and in what is increasingly becoming a totalitarian state. These are tendencies that have been going on for a long time, and I don't see anything uh, stopping them, really. I think those tendencies will continue. They're part of the stagnation and decline of capitalist institutions. Now, it seems to me that that development towards state totalitarianism and towards economic concentration, and of course they're linked, uh, will continually lead to uh, revulsion, uh, to efforts at personal liberation and to organizational efforts at social liberation. And they'll take all sorts of forms. I mean, throughout all of Europe, in fact, there are, in one 
form or another, there is a call for what's sometimes called worker participation or co-determination or even sometimes worker control. Now, most of these efforts are minimal. Uh, I think that they're misleading and, in fact, may even undermine efforts for the working class to liberate itself. But in part, they resp they're responsive to an in a strong intuition and understanding that coercion and oppression, whether by private economic power or by the state bureaucracy, is by no means a necessary feature of human life. And the more those concentrations of power and authority continue, the more we will see revulsion against them and efforts to organize to overthrow them. Sooner or later, they'll succeed, I hope. So it's going to be a time of turmoil, but perhaps also of, as you would see it, of creativity. Professor Chomsky, thank you very much.